Hi everyone and welcome to our episode five of Imagine Cup Junior Series um, as part of Dream Space Home Space. Um, my name's Amanda, joining me today is Corey. Hi everyone. And we have our team in the background to answer any questions. So throughout the webinar as usual, um, you can ask questions over there, the team will get back to you um, and we'll also try and answer questions as we go if we can. And obviously as well, today in particular actually, make sure to pause at certain points. We're going to try and do some, kind of like a, I suppose a, ta a few tasks with you to help you really drill down into your projects. So today actually, if you want to even pause now and go and grab um, some paper and a pen actually, um, because we'll, we'll ask you to pause at certain points just to jot things down and sketch out some ideas and things like that. So uh, if you want to go and grab that now and come back and hit play, we'll, uh, we'll carry on then. Okay. So up to this point in episode one to four, we have really been drilling and I suppose episodes one to three really drilling into AI and trying to really understand it. Episode four last week then we looked at the four AI for good pillars that you're going to have to um, know about because obviously you're going to pick one of them remember to kind of focus your project on. So both today and next week what we really want to do is help you maximize how good your project is. So today, as I said, we're going to be working through some tasks to help you really drill down into um, problem solving mode, solutions mode, um, ideation, all the things we've actually talked about before with design thinking. Um, and then next week, what we'll do is we'll kind of wrap that up and look at the kind of marking scheme, so to speak, that the judges will be using for the project so that you know exactly what you need to do to get the best marks um, and to succeed with this. OK, and we know up, up to now people are doing great work so it's about making sure that's framed properly and um, so that's our plan really Corey for the next two weeks isn't it? Yep it is. Now what's really important actually is um, that you are ready for for entering your project. Now as a student you um, you can't enter the project you need a teacher to enter the project for you and um, so what I would ask you to do is to make sure your teacher is aware of the web uh, website they need to register on. It doesn't take long I'm going to show you exactly what will happen and um, it's literally just the, their name their school name or your school name um, and their email address so that they're able to log back in and then submit your project on your behalf okay and the deadline remember for the project is due June 12th and um, so that's the web address there so if you wanted to even write that down now and make sure your teacher got a hold of it obviously the teachers can also look back on this video um, from early next week so they can see this for themselves but the idea would be to go on make a profile so that you can submit students projects um, and when they make their profile it just looks something like this so basically you can see this is mine um, and so it'll say their name the school's name and then over here it's very clearly laid out that you can just when you've done your project you email it or you send it or share it with your teacher they go on to their uh, account here and they click submit and then they just put in your name and um, your team's name and your um, your files so whatever it is whatever way you've done your project gets submitted that way and um, so if you can just make sure you, you have a teacher that could set that up for you and um, if there's any issues with that please do let us know either now through the q a or even through twitter which you know our handle is at ms underscore edu irl okay so up to now corey a couple of times we've mentioned design thinking haven't we yeah, we've really looked at it and we delved into it a couple of weeks ago in one of the webinars. Yeah, and we kind of touched on it again last week. We were saying, you know, you find your area and you use these things, but we've kind of just been leaving at that. At that. So what we want to do today is give you some, I suppose, um, methods to really use the design thinking approach. So we're going to really go through some tasks with you and some activities with you that hopefully will help you get through this. Um, now, you might already have a problem area selected, um, and a solution idea. But what you might find is the stuff we use today might help you actually drill down into it more. Um, and what I, what I want to point out about is when you look at design thinking, see these steps like, OK, it looks like they go in order, like you go from this to this to this to this. And you a lot of times people do. But a lot of times when you get to here to ideate or prototype, you circle back and you go back to empathy and you go back to further defining the problem and you ideate it again. And then you realize actually this is still too big. We need to go down another level and you go back again. So you can jump in and out of these different points. So even if you think you're at the point where you've come up with a really good idea through the tasks you do today, you might actually find that when you go back to empathize with it, you might further define your problem. And that will help because it means that you have a really clear um, project that you can submit then okay so 
Um, let's have a look. What we're going to do today is we're going to start making our way through this building your project framework and we're going to go from steps one to four today and we'll pick up on five and six in our next episode. OK, so let's start with number one there on the screen, which is finding a problem to solve. Now, again, as I said, you might already have done this, but we think the task we do today actually might help you further drill down into it, don't we, Corey? So yeah. we would ask you to still do this with us. We're going to get you to do a few tasks with us here. Now, to begin with, hopefully what you've done is you've found out of those four pillars we discussed last week, you have picked one that you really like, that you're very passionate about, that you think you've a really good idea for. But the passion for that idea is going to be the most important part, the part that inspires you. So out of AI for accessibility, AI for Earth, AI for cultural heritage and AI for humanitarian action. Pick one of them, remember. And then when you have that one picked, we want you to then look at a problem within that area. And a nice way to approach this is to start with like a sentence starter. So the sentence starter example we have there is, it is unacceptable that. And then basically you complete that sentence starter. So it helps us kind of think, right, there's some, there's an area in AI for Earth and this is unacceptable. So it could be like this example here. It is unacceptable that uh, there's too much rubbish in the ocean. OK, very straightforward. And there's loads of other obviously problems within AI for Earth that you could say it's unacceptable for something to happen. But we're just going to give you a couple of examples how we could complete these sentences. Now you could do this now if you wanted, you could pause. You might have already picked your AI uh, pillar, AI for good pillar, and you could write down the sentence. It is unacceptable that have a little think about it and then write down a couple of examples maybe, even if you think you've one you really want to go into. OK, so say for this one, for AI for accessibility, it is unacceptable that most restaurant menus are not accessible for our friends with dyslexia. OK, maybe for AI for humanitarian action, it is unacceptable that there are still widespread gender and race wage gaps. Or maybe for this one, AI for cultural heritage, it is unacceptable that there are important historical monuments that are being lost to the world. So there's a couple of examples where you could finish out that it is unacceptable, that statement. So if you want to pause now and actually on the top of your page that we asked you to go and grab with your pen, just start writing out a few of them. And we're going to now start moving from our it is unacceptable statements into what we can do about that. OK. So understanding the problem then. So Corey, do you want to take us through this? Yeah, definitely. So as Amanda said, we've already discussed finding a problem to solve. OK, but now what we have to do is we actually have to understand the problem and we can use a root cause tree for this. And this is actually an excellent tool because it lets us get a problem and then delve down into the nitty gritty of that problem. OK, so here we have our root cause tree. What I'd like you to do now is just pause go off and get some markers or colour and pencils and some paper and we'll do this together. OK, so in the trunk here we have the problem and the problem here is that there is lots of rubbish on the beach. OK, that's the main problem. That is the big problem. OK, but what we need to do there is that that's a huge problem. And what we need to do is we need to delve into the roots here and find find five main causes of this problem. OK, so once you've identified your problem in the trunk, what I'd like you to do then is pause me again and find your five main causes. So, for example, here with the rubbish on the beach, some of the causes can be that, well, at the beach, a lot of the time there's a lot of takeaways and those takeaways might have loads of food with plastic packaging. Um, the bins might be overflowing. OK, and this is a problem that's everywhere, to be honest, not just on the beach. Um, beaches attract tourists, OK, so tourist litter can be another cause of why there's so much rubbish and um, the birds messing up the bins, which I have personally fell victim to in my own home um, they sometimes swoop in and take your rubbish out of the bin and then they, they litter everywhere. So that's another reason. And then another one is poor education. OK, so what you see here is that there is a huge problem here, rubbish on the beach, but within that problem, there's reasons of why that's there. There's there's causes to that problem. OK, so once you have these five main causes down, what we then need to do is we actually need to even go deeper again. OK, we need to go deeper into those roots and have a look at what's going on. Ask ourselves why? Why is this happening? OK, so 
let's take poor education for an example, okay? Here it's saying, well, first of all, this might be happening because there might be very few signs at the beach about rubbish, okay? So people don't see signs, they might not even, it might not even clock in their heads, oh, there's bins around, let's do this. Um, another reason is that um, they're saying here that there was actually less campaigns around rubbish at beaches in 2019 and people might not even know the consequences of what their rubbish is doing to the oceans, okay? But one thing here I think is actually really interesting is it says that many people don't use the correct recycling bins. And I don't know about you, Amanda, but I actually think this is definitely one of the biggest problems that we have when it comes to rubbish. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like I think people might actually have good intentions of putting things in the right bins, but they just don't know, which is where the education piece comes in. Exactly. Like, so for example, you might have, you know, your general waste, your recycling, and then your compost, and people might not know what rubbish to put in what bin, and um, which causes another problem for example, it causes the bins to overflow then. So if you take, for example, um, if people don't know what goes in recycling and they don't know what goes in compost, they're going to just put it in general, okay? And this again comes back to people just having to educate themselves about recycling and what goes where. OK, so that's our root cause tree. And I would really, really, really recommend doing this because it, it really delves deep into what it is that you're trying to solve. OK, then what we would like you to do is actually choose your cause. OK, so for example, here you can see that we've highlighted that the cause that we'd like to solve is the bins overflowing. Because by solving that, we're getting one step closer to solving that huge problem overall about there being rubbish at the beach. So here they're saying, okay, when the bins overflow, why does that happen? Remember, keep asking yourself why. Well, first of all, maybe they don't get cleaned enough or cleared enough. And um, people putting things in the wrong bin. So again, people just assume and everything goes in general. And um, the design of the bin might be bad. And I've seen this firsthand where bins only allow you to put tiny bits of rubbish in. And if you can imagine, you know, I have myself walked around my local area and waited 20 minutes before I came across another bin. People, if they're on the beach, they might be thinking, oh, I'm not walking another 20 minutes to get a bin for my rubbish might not be able to fit in it again. I'm just going to leave it down here. OK, so make sure now you select the root cause that you'd like to solve and keep asking yourself why. Why is that happening? OK, so when you do find your cause, it's really, really important. And this is probably the most important to find data that supports you. OK, so it's important that you can say, well, Bad rubbish at the beach is caused because of poor education, but where's your data to back you up on that point, okay? So make sure when you're submitting your project, you have data that backs you up. But most importantly, it has to be from a credible and reliable source, doesn't it, Amanda? Yeah, it's really important, Corey. Like we, we, even for us, when we were doing our first webinars and we wanted to look at COVID-19 cases in Ireland, we went straight to the gov.ie website, the government website on it, as opposed to looking at newspaper reports and other things. And um, as you know, sometimes, obviously, a lot of times there's a lot of accuracy there, but if there are opinion pieces, which you might yeah. not realise, um, that's a bit different. So exactly. yeah, if people want to pause now, maybe, and kind of finish out their tree, yeah. Um, and then, as you said, then maybe think about even if you don't have time right now to do the research, maybe put a little asterisk or a little star there to say find data. Um, and after today's webinar, you can go off and further delve into that piece because that's going to be a really important piece for you to reference in your project. Definitely, because it's really important to have that data to back you up that's credible and reliable. OK, so now you have found your problem, you found your cause. So let's find the solution. All right. Now. Our advice would be to write down as many solutions that you can think of, OK? We have here, try to get 100 solutions, OK? So you might get 20, 40, 100. The more solutions, the better, OK? Because then you can start picking out which ones you think will work best. And remember, when you're writing down all these solutions, the best thing to ask is, how can we? So how can we better inform the public about recycling? How can we get better signage at the beach? How can we ensure that bins aren't overflown? OK, it's the most important question you need to ask yourself through this project. Now, step four, select and build out your ideas. OK, so you're after having all those solutions. You're after writing down 100 solutions and you're after asking yourself that question. How can we? And now it's time to take those solutions and pick your best one. Now, we're going to um, take some advice from Anna from Microsoft here, who is actually going to give you some tips on how you can take those solutions and pick the best one.
Hello, my name is Anna, and thank you so much for joining this year's AI for Good Challenge. At Microsoft, my job is to inspire people of what and how AI can positively impact society. Every day, I wake up and I am energized to learn and work with researchers, nonprofit organizations, policymakers, and citizens to bring AI stories and innovation into life. In this video, I will help you to learn how to select your best and most passionate idea and work together with your team. So now it is the time to choose your best idea, the one you feel it's the most unique and truly solves a problem that you all believe in. As you go through your projects, think about whether it solves the problem, which solves the problem the best, whether it could work in the real world, and if someone actually would use your technology to make the world a better place. Does it excite you? As a team, debate how you feel about each idea, listen to each other, and agree together which to proceed with. Once you agree to the final solution, take time to make your idea even better. Next, you will be looking at prototyping tips, making sure you are meeting with the judging criteria, how to align to the ethical principles, and being innovative. Thank you for joining this year's challenge, and I look forward to working with you all in the future with AI for Good. So just to recap on what Anna was saying there, so how can you go about selecting your best idea? Well, first of all, have a look at um, which best solves your how can we question. And then look at which ideas are ethical. You need to make sure your ideas are ethical, okay? And as Amanda said at the start, we will be going through ethics next week, won't we, in more in more depth? Yeah. So that's nothing that you, you have to worry about this week, but it is something that we'll be focused on next week, and it's hugely important to your project. Now, next one is which ideas could really happen? And this is all about buildability, okay? Remember, this is, this is something that you're being marked on in your marking rubric, okay? So can your ideas actually be built out, and are they realistic? And finally... Which idea excites you the most? Okay, and Amanda talked about this at the start. You can really tell when someone is passionate about a project that they're working on, okay? So it's important to maybe pick a cause that you are excited about, passionate about, or maybe even something that's close to your heart because it shines through then when you're talking about it, okay? Now, I am going to pass you back on over to Amanda who's going to go through um, prototyping and um, some questions. Yeah. Perfect. So if you want to pause at this point, actually, everyone, because um, we're nearly at the end, like this is one of our shorter webinars, because what we really want you to do is be engaging with the active active pieces there where you're sketching out. So just to kind of highlight what you should have done to this point is you should have picked your pillar. You should have said it is unacceptable that and have a problem. Do your out your tree where you dig deeper and deeper and deeper and then identify one of those areas and think, how can we? So that's where we want you to get to. Now, we're going to go into the idea of prototyping here. Um, and even though when we think of prototypes, we think of these physical built out parts. Remember, for prototyping, we don't necessarily need you to physically build it out, but we do need you to have nearly thought about or imagined the build. So you might actually sketch it. You might use images or diagrams. It doesn't have to be a physical thing. You might use flow charts to show prototypes and, and how things will work. And because hopefully you have the knowledge of AI and artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all of these things we've talked about in the previous episodes, you can actually then add that in to explain and further enhance your prototype. But let's look at an example here. We're gonna walk through um, a persona, what's called a persona prototype. We're going to take an example of looking at how we could develop something that would help two people. So we have Grandpa Joe and Grandma Mary here, and I'm sure lots of people might have a, a grandfather called Joe and a grandmother called Mary. Um, so we're going to take um, their story as an example. So this is a fictional story, but we'll take the story and then we think about, OK, what could we do? OK, now think about the, the design thinking model here is really important. So empathize. So putting ourselves in their shoes defining what the real problems are here, and then coming up with ideating solutions and then a prototype, just showing how it could be laid out for this to work, okay? So let's read Grandpa Joe and Grandma Mary's story first of all, right? So Grandpa Joe and Grandma Mary live in a large town with plenty of friends and a large family. They like their, inter they like their independence, but keep forgetting simple things like when to take their medicine, the names of people they know, grandchildren's ages and birthdays, 
their shopping lists and a few other things. This is really embarrassing for them sometimes. So can you help them? So straight away, I'd be thinking, OK, if I was the person that was looking to solve this problem for Grandpa Joe and Grandma Mary, I wouldn't be able to just start sketching right now. So, Corey, I think what I would do is actually I'd probably go visit Grandpa Joe and Grandma Mary. I don't sure. know about you. Yeah, I would probably ask them questions. So I'd probably have a load of questions written down and I'd probably go through questions about, you know, is there certain things that um, frustrate you more? Is there certain struggles you have? What do you actually really, what do you really want? What would be your top request? And um, really trying to understand how they feel and put yeah. ourselves in and their shoes. Them. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and then you could even actually, Corey, like a lot of the time, I don't know, Corey, did you watch The Big Life Fix? Yes, I loved it. Yeah, so over, and that's, if anyone didn't watch that series, but there was designers and engineers and lots of innovators, and they actually were trying to um, help solve or fix a problem that people had. And it was exactly that's what they did at the start. They went and visited them. They observed them. They asked them questions and um, they asked their families questions. So in this case, again, I would probably go and chat to Grandpa Joan, Grandma Mary's friends and their families and say, what do you think they really need help with? Like, have you, do you have a different viewpoint on it? And by taking in all of these perspectives, we've really empathized with them. And then that helps us come up with a solution. So let's have a look at the solution that's been made here after empathizing and defining the problem that we need to help um, with um, memory of certain things. And, and there's other things that you'll see in the solution that was noticed in the observation stage or the empathy stage too. We've come up with a solution. So let's have a look. So meet Bobby. So Bobby is a virtual grandson created to help Joe and Mary overcome some of the problems they face. With Bobby, they can use the camera on their phone to point at a face. So just let's try and remember different things here because this would actually link to stuff we've talked to previously. So that's one thing, isn't it, Corey? The phone yeah. to point at a face. So if we think back to Azure Cognitive Services, we had vision, didn't we? Yeah. And yeah. you actually demoed facial recognition, I think, didn't you? Yes, it's. I think it's one of the most fascinating. <laughs> yeah, so th it's there's so one example of AI in action there. Um, it will tell them who they are. So they point the camera to tell them who the person is. It will remind them not only to take their pills, but also when they need to go to the doctor to get more. So that kind of give, brings in the idea of a virtual assistant that we talked yeah. about to help people. And then as Joe and Mary have difficulty using the tiny keyboard on their phone. So, Corey, where do you think that came out of? So um, they have difficulty using tiny keyboard on their phone. So obviously they, it's an accessibility thing, isn't it? They can't they can't see it or they can't they can't yeah. use it. So it's not I, it's not fair. It's not accessible. Yeah, exactly. And I'd say it was probably like, again, if we were out with Grandpa Joe and Grandma Mary, we probably observed this. They were probably trying to use it and maybe they were fumbling and they were struggling with it. So, you know, yeah. we noted that and went, OK, this is something we need to help with. So we need to make this more accessible, like you said. Um, so uh, Bobby has big, colourful icons. So this virtual grants Bobby big, colourful icons and can even be voice activated. So there's another AI piece when we think about speech. Um, as one of our Azure Cognitive Services that we can plug into technologies as well. So even though this is a very um, I suppose this is very easy to read. What we'd probably want you guys to do with your prototype solution is you could give this example, but then you could also maybe show us a flow of where the AI technologies are sitting here and what they're backed up by. And is it, if, if possible, could you bring in the idea of machine learning and all those other things that we've touched on in the previous episodes as well? What do you think, Corey? Yeah, brilliant, because you have all the knowledge there behind you from the previous webinars, so don't be afraid to use it. Yeah, that's a really good point. So the outcome, which is what we want, because ultimately with all these things, with AI for good, it's all about helping. It's solving problems. And I can't imagine for people who have made some of these amazing technologies or worked on them, the feel good factor that brings to know you have really, truly made a difference. OK, so this outcome with Bobby's help, Joe and Mary are now no longer worried that they may forget the name of people they meet, forget to take their pills on time or how old their grandchildren are or when it's their birthday. So it's, it's solved that problem of the memories and reminders and all with the with the technology at the back of it. In fact, they're really happy to have Bobby's help and feel even more independent. OK, now that might seem quite straightforward, me reading out a couple of things there, but there's a lot going on there. There's a lot of empathy. There's a lot of defining problems. There's ideation. So coming up with ideas. And like I said earlier, potentially link like circling back to empathy and going again. So there's a lot going on there, isn't there, Corey? Yeah. OK, so what we want you to do again now is pause 
And out of the problem and the solutions you've come up with and the how can we see, can you storyboard a similar idea? Now, it doesn't have to be people. OK, in this instance here, we were looking at helping people um, particularly. But yours might be like, for example, it could be AI for Earth. OK, so it, and it might not be specifically. It could be something to do with the planet or agriculture or something like that. But can you storyboard that thing? So can we write the problem? And come up and it can be just in your head like imagine this right and then come up with a way of sol solution and storyboarding that out and then ideally what outcome you want from that because i think that will help you really imagine okay and really help you then when you're presenting your project be passionate about what you're saying okay so if you want to pause there and again on what you're doing in front of you keep going with with this with this brainstorming process because that's it for this week, actually. We are going to be next week finishing out this um, this um, timeline, I suppose. So we have gone from one to four now. Next week, we are going to look at the Microsoft AI principles and ethics. Now, we have touched on them before, but we will really reinforce these at the start of next week because they, they are a big part of actually, they're an, an actual area that you will be graded on. So we want to make sure they get enough time and focus. So we'll do that at the start of next week. And then next week as well, number six there, the very last step there is submit your project. So what we want to do is actually look at the marking rubric, OK, or the, the grading scheme of it. And we want to actually talk you through so that you know exactly what's expected to get the best possible marks. Because remember, that's the whole point of this. It's for us to help you in building your project before you submit it. So next week's our final episode. Can't believe that. Um, oh and God. I know it's crazy. It's time's flown by. So we're going to do we're going to do the last two next week and finish out. OK, so we might just. Um, oh, sorry. And one last thing. If uh, just a reminder again to talk to your teachers to get them uh, set up on the um, interface for Imagine Cup Junior so that they can submit your project in time. And again, we're here to help if there's any queries um, from them. OK, so we might just take any questions, Corey. Do we have any questions that we need to just address? Um, yeah, so um, someone just said here, um, can we give more examples of AI for humanitarian action? Um, and I think we have linked the home space files where everything is there. So we did actually go through AI for humanitarian action last week and you can find that video on YouTube. And if you go to home space files, you'll find there's a whole booklet on it, isn't there? With so much information. Yeah. Um, there's a whole so book on AI for good and in it is the humanitarian action. And there's also, I think before we talked about the aka.ms link, for, so aka.ms forward slash AI for good. And when you go to that page, all the pillars are there and you can click specifically into humanitarian action because we wouldn't have time to kind of cover it today or next week. So I think it's about going back and looking at the stuff we've already talked about if you can. Um, perfect. Any other ones, Corey? Um, I think another one is how do we actually go about like submitting our project? Is it a PowerPoint or a Word document or? Yeah, that's a really good point. So you actually have options for how you submit your project. So on that, I will actually submit. So yeah, it could be Word or PowerPoint. So I'm going to um, put up, there's a, I suppose there's a really helpful booklet and um, with information about how you submit your project and what should be in it, how it should be laid out, like an example layout is in there, as well as the marking scheme. Now, we'll also touch on that next week, but I'll submit that into the wake literally in the next half an hour. And if people need to go and check that, then they can. So remember, this is our uh, wakelet link. So we'll put that up there. And that's where all the other resources we just talked about um, are as well. And I can see another one here about when you're finding data, do you need to find facts to back you up or state a website? So I think it's no harm in, um, you can absolutely um, use facts that you've found, uh, but just make sure you reference them. So don't, don't just take what they've said and write them in. So if you're taking a, a fact, um, you know, just make sure that you you put them in inverted commas that you reference and then you just tell us where you got them from. So if it's a research, a journal or whether it's a URL for a website and um, just to just to make sure that that's backed up or referenced properly, which I'm sure you've covered before in in secondary school when you've been referencing things. Um, and then is there any other ones, Corey? No, I think that's it. Just again, to just make sure that it's a teacher that can register for you. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Um, OK, so I think that's everything, guys. Well done. And um, I hope we're really we hope today helped you really 
get a really clear picture of it. And obviously over the next week, feel free to start. I'll put that booklet up on this wakelet at this link. So you can actually start building out the layout of how you're going to present your project, whether it's in a, a PowerPoint or in a Word or whatever. Um, and then next week, we'll really talk about the marking scheme and the ethical sites that you have that boxed off. And then you should be good to submit and fingers crossed for everyone. So Woo. we'll chat uh, next week. So thank you so much uh, from myself and Corey and we'll chat then. Bye.